knowledge. Is power. Hey, it's Kat, and I'm back because what once was will be again. I got my thinky cap on so we can use history to divine the mysteries of the Game of Thrones. And this time, we're going to talk about Brianna Tarth, who is quite obviously Joan of Arc in history. And these two women share a lot more than being women with an affinity for armor. Joan of Arc was born during the Hundred Years' War between the French and the English. You know, a petty squabble over a crown. <laughs> and where she was born was Domremy, and it was considered an island of loyalty to the French crown. Because at that time, the English, with their Burgundian allies, controlled the north of France. And Domremy was this little bitty swath of land <laughs> right in the midst of their control. And we know, of course, that Brianna Tarth was actually born on an actual island. <clears throat> and very much like Joan of Arc, Brianna Tarth and Joan of Arc were both being raised in the womanly arts. They were being taught to weave and to spin and basically do all those woman things. But neither of them were all up for that. Joan of Arc's dad tried to arrange a marriage for her, and she refused, which is pretty interesting considering the time period they are in the women just did not do that. They didn't refuse. They took their father's word and they married when they were told to. Brienne of Tarth is said to have actually done the same thing. She refused a marriage arranged by her father, who became very angry with her. I can imagine that that's the same thing that happened with Joan of Arc. At the age of 15, Joan of Arc is said to have received uh, her first vision from the archangel Michael, telling her where a sword was buried in the ground. She did go and find this sword. It was very Arthurian. Brianna Tarth, on the other hand, at the age of 15, simply decided to pick up a sword and start training to be a knight. And she didn't care what anybody else said. Joan of Arc apparently didn't care very much either. Eventually, Joan of Arc received another vision, and the vision gave her a mission. And her mission was to put Charles the Dauphin on the throne of France as the true and rightful king. Similarly, we know that Brienne of Tarth believed that she had a mission as well, and that mission was to put Renly Baratheon on the Iron Throne as the true and rightful king. Now, Joan of Arc had to pass a couple tests before she could serve the Dauphin. When she arrived in Chinon, she was told she had to pass the test. She had to pick out the king amongst all his courtiers. Now, Charles the Dauphin was much like Renly Baratheon. He liked fine clothes and fine wine and to surround himself with good-looking people that were also dressed very well. So, supposedly, this is a bit of a challenge. But somehow, Joan, when she came into the court, went right to the Dauphin, dropped to her knees, and declared him her true and rightful king. Brienne had to pass a similar test, but it wasn't the king that was disguising himself. Brienne had to disguise herself as a knight and fight in the circle to prove that she was worthy to become the king's guard. Now, one of the things I found interesting is that Joan of Arc, after she began serving the Dauphin, he raised her to petty nobility and he gave her a coat of arms. And it looked like this looks kind of like the king's guard symbol doesn't it now we know what happened with Renly Baratheon he was killed by a shadow and somehow Brienne lost her mission but then she found Caitlin Stark who put her on her next mission and Caitlin gave her some armor and a sword but then Jamie Lannister gave her a sword a different sword we know that Joan of Arc would not be Joan of Arc without Yolande of Aragon. She was a very strong woman, much like Caitlin Stark, and she was the one that was pushing Charles the Dauphin to seek his crown. Without her, he might not have kept going. And she was the one that arranged for our friend Joan of Arc to come to the court. And then she arranged to get her armor, a sword, and a banner. Now this is where Brianna Tarth and jo Joan of Arc's story begin to coalesce a little bit more. Joan of Arc's next mission was to lift the Siege of Orleans. And if you saw my video about the Siege of River Run, it was very similar to Orleans, setting on a river, three sides, 
and it was under siege by an enemy force. Now, just a little bit different is that Joan of Arc actually went <clears throat> and lifted the siege, driving the English away. Part of the story goes like this, that she picked up her banner and got her small escort, and they started going towards Orleans. And as they went, they picked up an army, stragglers who had deserted, armed forces that were just wandering around with nothing else to do, not sure if they wanted to get involved in the fight, peasants with pitchforks, all joined her army so that when she got to Orleans, she was just not a girl with a banner. She had a fighting force. Is Brianna Tarth going to be successful in getting Blackfish to come out of his castle? It's hard to say. I think the smart answer is yes. But even if he doesn't, based on the Joan of Arc story, Brianna Tarth might in fact go north with an army. Because here's what we know. Rob's army, what's left of it, is still in the Riverlands. Sure, some went home, some many have scattered, but the Freys have been reporting that they've been under attack, that their supplies have been taken, that when they send men out to forage, they don't come back. The remnants of Rob's army, and maybe the Brotherhood, without banners or the brave companions or something of that nature, they're out there and they might end up going with Brienne north. Now here's the story of Joan of Arc that might tell us a little bit more about the possible future for Brienne. After the Battle of Orleans, Joan of Arc led the French into nine more battles. In fact, one of them was one of the most important. The English were in Paris preparing their defenses. They were fully expecting that the French would come to Paris because Paris was the city and whoever held Paris they believed held France. But in fact, under Joan's advice, the French turned and they attacked Reims because Reims was the ancestral city where all of the kings of France had been crowned. And they took Reims and Charles the Dauphin was crowned Charles the Seventh the true and rightful king of France. Now at this time, his father had obviously died and Henry V had also just passed away. Henry V had been the one who had taken the north of France. He had won the Battle of Agincourt. He'd pressed all the way to Paris. He forced them into the Treaty of Troyes where he was given the princess Catherine Valois, who was later Henry Tudor's grandmother. You can see my video about the Battle of the Bastards in the beginning, who is John Snow playing right now. But he was made the heir to Charles VI, the mad king who thought he was made of glass, <laughs> to be the next king of France. But he died and left a very young Henry VI, the mad king, on the throne, and it created a political vacuum at home and disarray in the English forces over in France. So this is one thing that definitely helped the French go forward and continue to win battle after battle. So do we see the possibility that Brienne goes north with this army and then becomes a leader of one part of this army? Because we saw in episode seven where Sansa and Jon Snow are talking towards the end and she points to Davos and she says directly to Jon Snow, this is your advisor? And it's a super good question because Davos has taken on the role of Jasper Tudor at this time. Jasper Tudor was Henry Tudor's uncle and he'd been fighting the War of the Roses for quite some time. But he, just like Davos, he'd been on the losing end over and over again. So it's a good question about who's going to lead. So Brianna Tarth, she can't be any worse <laughs> than, this, than this potential leader. So maybe, you know, she might have the most experience in terms of fighting and they see her as, a, you know, a, a right hand or a left hand <laughs> compared to Davos. But the other thing that happens is that the French do, in fact, drive the English almost out of France. But on the ninth battle, it was a draw. And Joan of Arc was taken prisoner. She was sold to the English who put her on trial as a heretic. They claimed because she wore men's clothing that she was violating a stricture of the Bible, that men were men and women were women. 
And it's one thing to don men's clothing for an, one expedient measure, or maybe two, but it's another to do it over and over again. And this proved her to be a heretic. Joan of Arc was actually pretty good at sidestepping a lot of their questions. She was smarter than the average bear. But the fix was in, and in 1431, the English burned Joan of Arc at the stake. Now, the reason they did this was pretty obvious. They thought if they got rid of Joan of Arc, the leader of this movement, that they would squash this movement and they would get back on track to taking back the rest of France. But it was already too late because Joan of Arc had turned a petty squabble over a crown into a frickin' holy war. So even though they burned her body three times until it was nothing but ashes and scraped it up and threw it into the Seine, after that she did become a martyr and people invoked her name. Later she was canonized as Saint Joan of Arc, the patron saint of France. So what's the possibility for Brienne's future here? She's going to go north, possibly with an army. She has to pass by where Ramsay Bolton has a hold and the phrase, who knows, does she get captured by the phrase and sold to Bolton? In the previews, we saw six crosses burning behind his army. Is it possible that she's won? But Joan of Arc definitely saw Charles the Dauphin crowned as the true and rightful king of France. And Sansa has not been crowned yet. So... Maybe later something else happens because we know that the Red Priestess and the religion of Rahola R is still around and she is not adverse to burning even innocents at the stake as a blood sacrifice to bring about the next phase that she thinks is supposed to happen. And then we have the church down in King's Landing who's turning increasingly fanatical. In fact, we saw the Sparrow talking to Marjorie and they were reading the story of the mother out of the scripture. And in this story, the mother is the gentle water of the river running around the rocks and smoothing the edges and calming the savage beast, blah, 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 blah. And let's face it, Brianna Tarth is not the mother, at least not the mother from that scripture. Brianna Tarth is the tiger mom. She's the, the mother bear with a cub. So maybe they see her as having violated their new rules of scripture. But this is all in the future. It's a bit of conjecture. It's just that this is Joan of Arc's character in history. This is what happened. She is sacrificed for the greater good. So Brianna Tarth is very likely to meet that same end. She will make some sacrifice for the greater good. And maybe like Joan, who became Saint Joan, the patron saint of France, we see Brienne being invoked as an inspiration and becoming Saint Brienne, the Saint of the North. Thank you very much. Read history. It's awesome. It tells you almost everything you want to know about the Game of Thrones. Almost. I also recommend a couple movies. There's a movie about Joan of Arc with Ingrid Bergman. And in this one, Ingrid Bergman is playing the very saintly and modest, divinely inspired maiden, you know, purity. <laughs> The other movie that I totally dig is The Messenger with Milo, Mila Jovovich. Look it up. It's The Messenger. And in fact, think about this because that is what Joan of Arc was called in history. And that is what Brianna Tarth is doing right now. She's delivering a message to Blackfish. <clears throat> and in The Messenger, though, Joan of Arc is portrayed as a little bit more driven and maybe even a little crazy fanatical. I think, like everybody can think about this, is that Joan of Arc was probably something in between. Because we know what it is in real life. When people become leaders and they come to the fore, they have a great message. They inspire people. And they don't have to be crazy. In fact, the crazier they are, sometimes the less people want to follow them. <laughs> but there you go. Thank you. Love history. And I love talking to you guys. Good